If you will, take your Bibles and join me. John chapter 4 tonight. I'm going to read a rather lengthy passage. I'm going to read all the way down through verse 30. So if you want, would like to, just go ahead and remain seated tonight. Rather longer portion of Scripture than we normally read. So but I do want to read John chapter 4. And you're really getting ready to think I'm lost because I'm getting ready to read Matthew chapter 4. John writes for us here. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph, and Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. There came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I am a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? who gave us this well and drank from it himself and his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never be thirsty, but the water which I give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw. He said to her, Go call your husband and come here. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have correctly said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At this point his disciples came up and they were amazed that he was speaking with the woman. Yet no one said, what do you seek? Or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. This is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. We'll, our hope is to get to that point tonight. Let's have a word of prayer before we begin into this. Father, again, we do thank you for the privilege of being here. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you uh, for how you, in your wisdom, um, put the Bible together. You have preserved it from generation to generation. And these very words that we read tonight, Father, we believe 
the Apostle John was inspired by the Holy Spirit to write these things down so that we would have a record of them today, so that we, as, as he writes in his gospel, so that we can believe that Jesus is the Son of God and believe in we may have salvation. We thank you, Lord, that the, the word of God has been preserved. We thank you that it has been translated, that we do not have to know Greek and Hebrew in order to understand it. Our prayer tonight as we spend some time in study is that we would see Jesus. Lord, we would see him in his humanity. We would see him in his, his deity. We would see his grace and his kindness. Now, Father God, not just see it, but we pray that it would have such an impact on our own lives that we would emulate him. We would begin being imitators of Christ and demonstrating the same grace and mercy to those around us. We ask this in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our last time we were together on Sunday night, we did get to verse 14, where Jesus had told her that everyone who drinks, uh, drinks of the water that uh, she was drawing would be thirsty again, but whoever drank of the water that he would give would never thirst. And in verse 15, the woman replies to him, and we need to understand there's probably a little, little bit of sarcasm in her response. Um, I mean, he, th this is a man sitting in front of her who has no water pot, or he had drawn his own drink, right? Um, he, he's asked her for a drink of water, and now he, she tells him, um, why are you asking me this? Because you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, I'm a woman, you're a man. Why are you asking me of this? And so then he says, if you knew the gift of God, you'd ask me for a drink. She said, you don't have anything to draw. And, and then he says, you know, if you, if you ask me the water I give you, you'll never thirst again. And so she's playing along with him. And she says, okay, sir, give me this water. And I will never have to come out here again. I'll never be thirsty again. And I'll, I'm just going along with what you're telling me. There are some benefits to what he's telling her that she can see. Remember, she's coming to this well alone because of her reputation, because of her sin, because of the fact that she has had five husbands and the man she's with right now is not her husband. The other women don't want her to be a part of them. She is coming out to this well in the heat of the day. And maybe if there's a well closer, and there may have been a well closer to the city, she's having to come out here because she's not allowed to go to that one. And so she's seeing a benefit to this impossibility that Jesus has given her. And so she says, give me this water. I'm calling your bluff. Give me this water, and that way I don't have to come all the way out here, and I will never thirst again. But she's missing the point. She's still on water. Jesus is trying to get her to understand that she has a need. When she got there, in her eyes, he is the one with the need. He needs the water, right? Well, she needed water too or she wouldn't be at the well, right? But Jesus is trying to get her to see she has a greater need and a need that only he can fulfill only a need that he can meet. And so he tells her, you ask of me and I'll give you water that will well up from inside and you'll never thirst again. So she asks for this water, sarcastically most likely. And so then Jesus begins to hone in on the issue. He tells her, go, call your husband and come here. This request of Jesus or this command of Jesus really serves two purposes here. I told you last time we were together that men and women who are not married do not carry on prolonged conversations like this. It, it was just frowned upon by society, whether it be Samaritans or Jews. They, you just didn't do this. And so that would satisfy the fact that her husband is with her now. Now everything is out in the open. Now everything is seen. There's no secrecy. There's no, no issues going on here. And so he tells her, go call her husband. But not only that, now he is bearing in on her need. 
he is confronting her with her need. And so he tells her, go call your husband. In order for an individual to repent of their sins, in order for an individual to come to salvation in Christ, they must recognize that they are a sinner. They must recognize that there is a need for forgiveness. They have violated the law of God. They have, they, their actions and their life has been an affront to God, an affront to Christ, and they stand condemned before him. Until an individual recognizes that they are a sinner in need of salvation, you cannot be saved. That recognition has to be there. She hadn't recognized that yet. And so Jesus is beginning to dig that out. And he's beginning to reveal to her what her issue is. And she responds in verse 17 very, very strongly. I have no husband. It's true. She doesn't. But you can almost see right here, and if you've ever witnessed to someone, and especially someone you know the sin that's in their life, whether it, whatever it is, you know the sin that's in their life, all you got to do is touch it. Their demeanor changes, their attitude changes, and it's time to shut down the conversation. Not just, not just change the conversation. The conversation's over. This is her attempt at saying, we're done. I'm not talking with you anymore. I have no husband. You have gone too far. We're not talking about this. And can you imagine the shock she goes through when Jesus replies to her and says, you have answered correctly. You have correctly said, I have no husband. At that point, you can see her saying, I told you that. I know, no, I don't have one. And then he says, for you have had five husbands. That would have been shocking enough. And then he says, and the man you have now is not your husband. I don't know about you, but I might have passed out. How does he, this is her, this will be her asking, how does he know this? She doesn't deny it. Nowhere, in fact, in a minute, she's going to run to town and she's going to tell everybody, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Not that I told him everything I ever did. He told me. But let me ask you, how does this man know this? And I'm just kind of challenging you here. He is fully man. I know he's fully God, but he set aside his divine attributes. How does this man know? I, I would answer that by saying the Holy Spirit revealed this to him. In this time, the Holy Spirit has led him to this place. And the Holy Spirit has revealed he is in constant communion with the Father. Yes, he is fully man, but he's in constant communion with the Father. I believe the Holy Spirit has, has revealed this to him. Now, most people are going to say, well, he's, he's God. He's omnipotent. He knows everything. Yes, he does. But I don't think we have to go there. I think we can look at Jesus Christ as fully man because he came to live as a man and say, the Holy Spirit revealed this to him. Either way, he knows, right? Whether the Holy Spirit revealed to him or whether he, he used his all-knowing ability and knows, he knows. And so he tells her, you have said right, I have no husband. You've had five, and the one you are with now is not your husband. I love verse 19. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Let's change the subject. That's another way you can translate that. Let's change the subject. I don't like this subject. 
Think about her for a moment. She has had five husbands. And the man she is with now is not her husband. Regardless of who's to blame for five failed marriages, this woman is hurt. This woman has endured a life of pain and suffering. Maybe physically, maybe emotionally, it might have been her fault. But even if it was her fault, she has gone through a life and is still in the midst of a life of pain. She isn't still in a life of pain because she has no communication with other people. She is by herself. Don't want to talk about this. I don't want to talk about it. So she does recognize something. So she says, sir, I perceive you to be a prophet. Our fathers, your fa our fathers say we ought to worship in this mountain. Jews say we worship in Jerusalem. Who's right? Let me get this off. Let's, let's get the subject off of me and get it on to something else. But I want to point something out to you here. She may be getting it here. She just might begin to be understanding who this man is sitting there. Now, why do I say that? Because the Samaritans only use the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They only have those five books. They only utilize those five books. And they only recognize two prophets. One would be Moses. He is the great prophet. And then they hold to Deuteronomy 18.18 18 that says this. Moses is speaking to the people and he says, I will raise up a prophet from among their countrymen like you. God is speaking through him. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. They're saying Moses was a prophet. The Samaritans believe Moses was the only prophet until that prophet comes. They don't recognize any other prophet. And she says, sir, I perceive you to be a prophet. Deuteronomy 18, 18. She is starting to grasp a hold of something here. She doesn't have it fully yet. But she's like, uh, you might be him. And let's quit talking about me. Let me change the subject. And not only change the subject, this could be a test question. If you are really a prophet, you can answer this question. And so she says, our fathers, meaning the fathers of the Samaritans, worshiped in this mountain and you people. You see the, the, the prejudice that's still in her heart here? Our fathers, mine, said we worship here. You people, you Jews, said that Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she wants to know, where, where, where is it? When, when you go back and read through the Exodus, when the children of Israel come into the promised land, Deuteronomy 27 and 28 says that they come in and they were to divide. Half of the, half of the people were to go on Mount Gerizim and half of the people on Mount Ebal. And God, uh, Moses, or the, the leaders were to pronounce the curses and the blessings, the blessings on Mount Gerizim and the curses on Mount Ebal. And so the Samaritans said, that's the place where, since that's where the blessings were pronounced, that's where you worship. Since that's where we came in and the blessings were announced and the people on that mountain, amen, the blessings, that's where we should worship. But the Jews turned around and said, no, 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 no. Solomon built the temple in Jerusalem. It's God's temple, so that is the place that we are to worship. And so she's staying with a she's staying with a spiritual conversation here. She is testing him. Are, are you really a prophet? Can you answer this question? Because the prophet of Deuteronomy 18:18 18, 18 will know the answer to this. She will know that. This will not be a Jewish answer or a Samaritan answer if he is a prophet. And it's a big discussion because this was a point of contention, another point of contention between the Jews and the Samaritans. So she asked him, 
Where do we worship? You recognize Jesus' first word here out of his, uh, his response. That's how he responded to Mary when she asked him, she come and told him they had no wine in Cana. He said, woman. Now he speaks to her and he says, woman, believe me. You've asked me for something. I'm going to give you an answer. Believe me. That's another way in the King James often you see him say, verily, verily, I say unto you, he is saying, this is of certainty. When he says, believe me, this is of certainty. An hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Stop there. Do you, do you see that? Where you will worship your Father? Uh uh where you will worship the father of the Jews? No. Where you will worship my father? Uh-uh. He said where you will worship the father. Not the father of the Jews, not the father of the Samaritans, the father of all who come in true worship. It, there's a uniting. He is breaking down the barrier between the Jew and the Samaritans right here. He said, no, nah, no, no, no. We're coming together as one the Father. He goes on. And here he's going to sting a little bit. He is staying with her designations. You, and that's a plural you, so he's not talking about just a woman. He's talking about all Samaritans. You worship what you do not know. I told you they only, they only recognize the Pentateuch. They reject the Psalms. They reject the prophets. And by rejecting that, they do not have what at that time was the most complete picture of the coming Messiah that was available to them. They rejected most of it. And so their worship was inadequate because they were not worshiping God rightly because they do not understand him rightly. They have a little bit of an understanding, but they have rejected so much more. And so he says, you worship what you don't know. And then he says, we worship what we know. All right, now, he is, he's not just pointing to himself. He's saying, you, you, you're calling me a Jew, so I'm going to recognize with that side the Jews worship what they know. Now, he's not saying that the Jews have a complete understanding because many of them did not. There were very few that were really looking for the Messiah as he was going to come. Most of them had this political idea, this military idea of the coming Messiah. But he says, we worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. Two ways that salvation is from the Jews. One, it's because God has revealed it to them, and he revealed it to them because they were to be vessels to carry the gospel to the world. But two, where did Jesus come from? Jesus is the mode of salvation, and he was born a Jew. And so he's saying salvation is from the Jews. Now he says in verse 20, three, but an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father, there it is again, the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. He's saying the worship, the true worship, Will not, necessarily, will not be in a mountain. It will not be in a temple. The error of both the Samaritans and the Jews is that their worship was external. It was through ceremony. It was through, it was through rites, and it was through things that they did. And he's saying, that's not it. He, he tells her here, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit. Uh, worship has got to be an internal thing. It's not what we 
do. It's not the sacrifices that the Jews and the Samaritans brought. It wasn't, it's not pilgrimages that they take in other religions. Worship comes from within. It is in the heart. It is inside of the individual. But that's not enough. He doesn't say worship in spirit and stop. Spirit and truth. You've got to know God rightly, to worship God rightly. It, you hear these people sometimes, you know, they, they, they're, they're, they don't study their Bibles, they don't read their Bibles, but because they're Americans, they know God. They've heard God. And they say, well, I worship God, but they can't tell you anything about him. Let me use an illustration here. If, if I were to run into Jay on the street, or run into you on the street, and you say, hey, do you know Jay? Oh, I know Jay. And they say, well, have you ever met his two sons? No, Jay doesn't have any children. Jay doesn't have a wife. Do I know him? I may know him by sight. I may know him by name. But I do not know him rightly, especially if he has introduced me to these God has revealed himself. And so we are responsible for understanding and knowing what he has revealed to us so that we can worship in spirit, internally, not with outward actions, and truth. He says such a, there is such a time coming when you will worship in spirit and truth. And then it, look, he says, for people are seeking the Father to worship this way. That's not what it says, is it? For the Father is seeking, seeks to be, uh, for such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is seeking people to worship him. He is the active seeker here. We hear all these seeker-sensitive churches. God is the seeker, not man. And he is seeking people to worship him in spirit and truth. And so he finished, God is spirit and those who worship him must. That is a huge word there. There is no other way. It is not by the ceremonies. It's not by must worship him in spirit and truth. Earlier, he, he said, you, meaning the Samaritans, worship what you do not know. Notice how she responds to him. She says in verse 25, the woman said to him, I know. All right. This is not an argument. She, she's not debating him, but she says, she reveals to him something she knows. She says, I know that the Messiah is coming. Is that a truth? The Messiah is coming, wasn't he? He who is called Christ. When that one comes, he will declare all things to us. She said, you, you're, you're saying I worship what I don't know, but I do know this for truth. The Messiah is coming. Remember, she said, I perceive you to be a prophet. And then she gives him a question. Can you reveal this to me? I know that the Messiah is coming. And when he does, he will reveal all things to us. And Jesus responds by saying, I who speak to you am. The he is just kind of added in our translations. But he says, I am the one you're talking to. I am the Messiah. Very seldom in Scripture does Jesus that bluntly reveal himself to be the Messiah. And he does to a Samaritan woman. He is breaking down all these barriers that men build. He reveals himself very plainly as the Messiah to a Samaritan woman. And it says at this point his disciples came and they were amazed. I, I often, I find it funny how often they seem to be at the right place at the wrong time or always saying the wrong thing at the wrong time. They've been going to get food. He's in this conversation. He is 
drawing this lady to salvation and his disciples show up. They see him talking with a woman again. You don't do that. But they are starting to learn a little bit about him. They don't always follow through with what they know, but as they come up and they see them talking, notice it says that when they get there, it says they were amazed that he's speaking with the woman, yet no one said, what do you seek? That is a question that was not asked that would have been directed to her. They would have asked her, what are you looking for? Why are you talking to him? And then the other question would have been directed to Christ. Why do you speak with her? But they don't ask. Evidently, already in their past, they've asked some, some questions, and Jesus has come at them with an answer where they're like, no, this man does what he wants to, when he wants to, and when we ask him stupid questions, he rebukes us. We're not going to ask. We're just going to sit back and watch. So they come up. They don't say anything. And look at what verse 28 says. So the woman left her water pot. Why did this, why did this conversation start? Jesus was there because he was weary, sitting by the well. What did she come to do? She come to draw water. She takes off back to town and she leaves her water pot. She had a mission when she got there, right? Get water. She's got a completely different mission now. That water pot is secondary to what she has to do at this moment. And so she leaves her water pot and she goes into the city and said to the men... Picture this in your mind. She goes into a city that wants nothing to do with her. Right? The women won't let her go with her, them to draw water. If the men want anything from her, it's definitely not water. It's not a relationship with her. They don't want anything from this woman. They know how wicked and vile and evil this woman is. And so it says, she came and said to the men, come, see a man who told me all the things that I have done. I wonder what John didn't include in this story. The only thing Jesus did is said, you've had five husbands and the man you're with is not with you now. She says, come see a man that has told me all the things that I have done. There's... A good possibility John hasn't included everything that was said between them two. She said, come see. But I want you to notice how smart this woman is. She is a, in their eyes, a wicked, vile sinner. They're the holy ones, not her. So she comes and she says, come see the man who's told me everything I have done. She is convinced and she says, this is not the Christ. Could it be? I mean, he's told me all this. Could this be the Christ? You, you know better than I do. You're the holy ones. I, I'm, I'm the wicked sinner. I'm the vile one. You, you know this. You tell me. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the one Notice she's not telling him anything. She's not coming in and saying, hey, I've met the Messiah. No, she knows she's met the Messiah. She wants them to, but she also wants to be heard. So instead of coming across as, I know better than you do. I know you know me, but I know better than you do. Let me tell you what he did. And what do you think? C could this be him? And it worked. It says in verse 30, they went out of the city and were coming to him. The tense of those verbs, were coming, means that they just kept pouring out of the city. Person after person after person, and they just kept going to the well. 
because this woman come back and said, could, could this be him? In this conversation, <laughs> this woman shows up and she has no idea what she needs. None. And it is not until Christ reveals the sin in her life that she repents and turns to him. It's not until she sees who Christ is. That is our evangelistic goal. We have to, with mercy and gentleness and grace, help people see their sin. That's one of the reasons why we use the law in evangelism. People must see their sin. That's not enough. We can't leave them there. If they recognize their sin, we have to point them to Christ. She knew he was coming. And he says, I am he. I encourage you, keep doing what you're doing. Keep witnessing, keep encouraging people, keep witnessing to him, pointing people to Christ. But let's make sure, and I'm not saying you don't, I'm just saying let's make sure because so many don't. Let's be, let's be witnesses who demonstrate grace and mercy. That was Christ. Grace and mercy to lead people to salvation. Let's have, before we close, any, any kind of questions, any comments anybody wants to add? All right, well, now let's close with a word of prayer. Our gracious Father, as we conclude our time together today, we thank you that at some point in our past, in a like manner, you revealed yourself to us. You, you brought one of your witnesses. They were gracious and kind. They, they shared the gospel. They, they shed the light on our wicked hearts and the wickedness within us and convinced us, helped us understand our great need of salvation. Father, they also shed the light upon the cross and Christ. We thank you for that. We pray, Lord, that you'd help us to be uh, like witnesses. Help us to follow the example of Christ, steering conversations to spiritual matters, steering conversations to uh, help people recognize their need of a Savior and then steering them to understand and see Christ for who he is. We do thank you for the, allowing us to be here today, to, for allowing us to express our gratitude and our praise and our worship to you. We ask that you go with us as we leave here tonight. Father, as we go into the work week, as we go to school, as we, uh, the various things we have to do this week, use us for your honor and glory. Help us to make the most of every opportunity to magnify Christ before our world. We ask this in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.